December 17th. Ask us Lake Year. I came out to a maelstrom of mess. As bad as it had been the morning before, it was ten times as bad now. As I came into the living room, I wasn't sure there was one piece of furniture still upright. The TV had been pushed over, the cord cut, and the screen cracked. The couch was overturned, and my recliner was sliced and pierced. The coffee table was so much kindling now, and they had ground mud and food into the carpet. Someone had taken coal from the coal box and scrawled messages on the wall in a language I couldn't read, and the table was gouged with runes and strange marks. The worst part was that Grendel was nowhere to be found amongst the mess. I moved into the kitchen, hoping maybe I'd find him there. The kitchen was equally as wrecked. Plates and mugs lay in pieces across the linoleum, some of it having been peeled up in ribbons. The bake light on the front of the stove had joined it after being shattered, and the smell of spoiled lamb stew lay heavy amongst it. There wasn't a pan or a pot left in the house. The silverware absent to the last teaspoon. What they hadn't eaten or taken, they had thrown around the house, and the whole thing just made me angrier. I had hoped to find Grendel in there, but the longer he was absent, the less likely it seemed that I would find him alive. I looked for him high and low, figuring they had simply killed him when he ran at them. But when I heard him sadly mewing, I honed in on the sound. At least we wouldn't have to bury Davin's cat today, I told myself, as his mews brought me to the laundry room off the kitchen. His meows were coming from the chest freezer beside the two-tier washer dryer and the small utility room where I kept my meat. The poor thing had been closed inside and he was shivering pathetically as he tried to push the door open. He jumped into my arms when the freezer came open, and the fearsome little beast butted his head against my chest as he tried to find warmth. It seemed that in these dire times, even Grendel was willing to make friends with his enemies. Davin held his arms out for him when I came into the room, and the big black feline jumped into his arms like a kid at the end of a school day. Davin rubbed his cold fur, trying to get some warmth back into him, and the cat looked at me as if to say, Thanks. I guess you aren't completely useless. Davin was mooning over him when I left, yawning as I thought longingly about my bed. I wanted to curl up with my brother and the cat and sleep in a big warm pile as the mess sat outside. Instead, I began cleaning up. The longer I cleaned, the madder I got. This was too far. If I hadn't found him earlier, Grendel could have frozen to death. They were attacking in numbers now pot scraper amongst them. Tonight there would be six, and if Grendel patrolled tonight, he wouldn't do it alone. I set about making preparations for nightfall, as Davin got up and got ready for the day. He didn't ask about the mess, he knew by now that it was Yule Lad related, and set about helping me put the house to rights. Not for the first time, I was glad for his company. I couldn't imagine having to do this alone, and between the two of us, we started setting things in order. When someone knocked on the door a little after seven, he went to answer it as I cleaned jelly off the wall near the fireplace. Ulf blew out a loud whistle as he came in. <sighs> Looks like you pissed them off good. You come to gloat, or you come to help us clean? I asked curtly. Neither. I came to see if Davin would like to work with me today. Davin perked up, but I glowered at Ulf darkly. I thought you wanted to keep him out of sight for a few days. Ulf lifted a hand placatingly. I had to go off farm yesterday, and I couldn't carry him with me as such an errand. I'm here today, though, and I can keep a close eye on him. Why? I asked, becoming worried and angry. I was tired, and his words were sounding more and more like a threat. Just, just a good idea to keep him close, he finished, Davin coming out in his work clothes. Don't worry, I'll watch him like he was my own, Ulf promised. Davin looked at me pleadingly, and I couldn't say no. Ulf was my best friend, and he and Davin had formed a fast friendship too, it seemed. If Ulf was offering to let him work with him, I couldn't very well take that from him. I nodded, ruffling his hair as he threw a hug around the big Icelander. Could you feed him? I asked, suddenly aware that neither of us had eaten. Someone seems to have stolen all my food, and it wasn't you for a change. Ulf looked wounded, but smiled. Sure, and I'll make sure the poor lamb doesn't starve. As for yourself... He reached outside the door and dropped off two paper bags with food in them. Mum said to collect the bowls when you finish today. 
She's certain the lads will have made off with her stew pot from yesterday. I looked ashamed, promising to buy her a new one, but Ulf just brushed it off. We're family. We look out for each other. They left for the fields, and suddenly I was alone with my mess and my thoughts. I used the time I had to prepare the house. I plugged up, secured, or sealed any opening into the house. I used adhesive to secure the windows, hooking bells to them so I'd know if they were opened. I clogged the drains with towels and washcloths, even stuffing a towel down the mouth of the toilet and putting a heavy block on the lid. I sealed cracks where I found them, using some cement that I had in the shed to seal up even the smallest crack. The chimney presented a bigger problem. If it was big enough for a Father Christmas to creep down, then it would be plenty big enough for a Yule Lad. They could close the flue, but that had never stopped Father Christmas to my knowledge. In the end, I stoked the fire and hoped they could still be burned like normal creatures. My brother had came home just before dark. I wrapped a plate of food in one hand to find me on the couch, sharpening a hatchet. He nervously glanced around the house. Looks like you've been busy today. I nodded, my eyes still on the chimney. They would have to come in through the front door or the chimney. That was a given. And when they did, I meant to spot them and stop them. I didn't know what I meant to do when I saw them. The rifle shot hadn't even dropped the one lad, but I meant to do something. I was tired of having my home terrorized by these little assholes. Davin held up the plate of food. Sigrun sent you some dinner. She figured that some of our stuff was probably missing, so she made you a plate to go. An idea occurred. Set it on the counter, I said, the wet stone still sliding over the axe. Don't you want to eat it? It's still hot. Just set it down. I'm hoping it'll lure pot liquor out. Davin set the food on the counter and shrugged as he walked to the bedroom. I think I'm just going to go read. You seem kind of busy in here. He gave me a weird look, heading into the bedroom to read one of the Hardy Boys novels I had from when I was his age. I was busy, but I hoped not for much longer. As the fire burnt, consuming the fuel I had piled in there, I hunkered beside the couch and waited for them to come. I had done a little research on the potato they had left me. Apparently, it was the only thing they left for naughty children. They were about to see just how bad I could be. Grendel came to sit with me, keeping a wary eye on me as he watched the room. He, too, was the guardian of this place, and he took his sacred trust very seriously. He would never come close enough for me to touch, but I knew that he understood that we were in this together now. I hunkered in the twilight as I waited for them, listening to the house as it creaked and groaned in the light wind outside. I had lived here since I came to stay with them after my father died, and to me, the house was as much a member of the family as Ulf or Arnar. I knew the house, top to bottom, knew how it groaned in the wind, how it seemed to hold its breath in the snow, and how the roof beams seemed to sigh on sunny days. That was a part of my anger as well. They were hurting my house, hurting my friend, and I couldn't let this go on. It was around 1 a.m., when the soot of the chimney started to powder down into the flames. I had only recently added more fuel, creeping back to my spot as my sleepy eyes tried to close. As the ashes rained down, I felt a surge of adrenaline roll over me. They were here, they were coming, but they wouldn't be getting what they expected. They rolled down the chimney, just missing the fire, and landed on my hearth rug. There were six now, as I suspected. Sheep Coot, with his wooden leg smoking, Gully Gock with his frothy beard and little pig eyes, a bandage on his right arm that I was glad to see was painting him. I saw Stubby, who was at least half as tall as the rest and covered in pans, spoon liquor, thin and haggard, pot scraper, wearing a bandolier about his rotund body. Finally, there was a strange sixth member tonight. He was dressed in what could kindly be called armor and jokingly be called an assortment of wooden pots. They had once been used to store food under people's beds and their lack of iron probably made this ideal for a creature like him. The lid would serve as a helmet, his yellow eyes peeking from beneath it as he held a long hook on the end of a wooden staff. He looked around warily, not as lackadaisical as the others, and seemed to be on guard as he moved for the fridge. They all reminded me of goblins, their skin looking like uncooked dough, and their features pointy and menacing. All of them had knives in their belts, Stubby's blade little more than a sewing needle, and Pot Scraper had an assortment of jars and bottles and a pepper mill on that bandolier around his chest. They all looked like homeless Santas, red coats, red pointy hats, scabby white beards, 
big, dirty, homemade sweaters poking out from beneath their overalls. But in the firelight, they all looked more like evil elves who had broken free of a toy shop. Even the armored Askeslakir looked like some child's idea of a knight as he held his pole arm and slunk around. None of them were taller than three and a half feet, though, and I was pretty confident that I could bowl them over and send them running. They set straight to their work. Stubby checked for pans. Sheepcoot went to my freezer and grabbed for the frozen sheep cutlets I kept there. Spoon Licker had to settle for licking the spoons on the wallpaper of my kitchen. Gully Gox set about finding cream in my refrigerator, throwing things on the floor as he hunted. Pot Scraper went straight for the leftovers, as I had known he would, and selected a jar from his belt to season them with. I saw the stalking form of Grendel as he moved in on Spoon Licker, and I prepared for my own charge when he attacked. I clenched my axe and lifted the bat in the other hand, the end studded with nails that I hoped the legends would be right about. Grendel stalked closer, Spoon Licker oblivious to his approach. The other lads were about their tasks and never so much as noticed as I slunk stealthily around the couch. The bristling Tom let out a single yowl as he leapt. The daffy troll turned to look up just as he was buried under a pile of fur and claws. Spoon Licker cried out in a guttural voice like a soccer hooligan, and the other lads were in motion as they looked around to see what was going on. I yelled as I swung the club, running at Potscraper as he coolly stared me down and tossed whatever it was in his hand at me. A cloud of powder enveloped me, and I was stopped cold as my eyes stung and my nose ran. I had stepped into a whirlwind of heat, and I shut my eyes as the clouds swirled around me. The first time I was stabbed, I barely felt it, with all the adrenaline kicking around in me. By the tenth time, it was just one more pain amongst many. They stabbed me in the ankles, in the legs, in the calves. Stubby jumped up and drove the needle right into my ass cheek, and I swung the club and axe around like a blind fool. I struck things off the counter. I hit the refrigerator with a metal clong, and the powder around me never seemed to dissipate. I heard Grendel hiss and spit, yowling as he savaged something, and when the stabbing stopped, I was aware of being on my knees. My eyes were on fire, the black powder seeming to proliferate, and I set about in my blind state to stop any of them from getting closer. There was a scuffling sound, Grendel still hissing and spitting as he chased them, and then silence. I coughed, eyes still burning from whatever pot scraper had thrown at me. My breath felt hot and heavy as I sucked it in, and the tears streaming down my face were thick and angry. I put my hands out, feeling my way to the sink and tried to wash the mess out of my stinging eyes. I could feel the powder coating my face like sand, and as the water hit my skin, the scrim came off like makeup. The heat intensified for a moment, reacting to the water, but as it washed away, I felt relief and managed to open my eyes. I tensed up as something butted against my wounded leg, but it was only Grendel, the sleek black Tom limping a little but otherwise fine. Davin stood in the hallway, peeking at me from the doorway as he took in the scene. It was a real mess in here. The refrigerator had a big cut from my wide swing. The bat was sticking out of the hardwood floor like a ghastly tumor. Dishes had been smashed, and metal bins and holders had been upturned across the counter floor. Flour and powder were everywhere, and as my vision stopped wavering, I knew I'd have a big mess to clean up tomorrow. Are they gone? Davin asked, looking scared and curious. I sighed. Yeah, kid. For now. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Happy holidays from everyone here at Dr. Plague's house, and I hope you're enjoying the Yule Lad Diaries. I want to make a little amendment from yesterday. I had uh, actually meant for Pot Scraper to be a little bit more of a, kind of like a tool user. And um, I think I was thinking more about a bowl liquor that we have from today. Pot Scraper, I had imagined, was probably one of these guys that carries a lot of spices on him. Something to spice up the little bit of food he gets from, you know licking unwashed pots. Maybe something he could use as a weapon in case he's attacked by people like the guy in this story. Now, Askeslakir, or Bowl Licker, steals bowls of food from under beds. Back in the olden days, you see, Icelanders used to sometimes store food in bowls under there, convenient for midnight snacking. Having seen pictures, they're these just big wooden bread bowl looking things, and I imagine they'd make pretty good armor for something around his size. So, looks like we are six lads deep, and we've got about another seven to go. 
I hope we'll see you for the rest of the Yule Lads Diaries, so you can meet the lads and hear how this story comes out. If you're looking for something else spooky to watch, might I suggest my holiday playlist. It's perfect for whatever you're doing, you know, tree trimming, or making eggnog, or, you know, plotting revenge on your sister who got you that ugly sweater last year. Tonight's recommendation is The Sounds from the Woods. A group of homeless people are telling a story, and one of them talks about a time when a couple of boys found something in the woods that maybe they just couldn't handle, and the one that walked away who would never forget his lost brother. If you'd like something a little more substantial to take with you, might I suggest my latest book, Fall Frights and Autumn Chills. You can find the link below and get it on Amazon. I'm sure that if you get it shipped now, it'll be here by Christmas time. If you'd like to give the gift of your patronage this year, I'd suggest come on down to Patreon. For just $25 a month, you can join our Ghost Rider tier and have me write something special for you. Maybe you've got an idea for your own horror story. Maybe you've got an idea for something even worse. I don't know. Come on down and have a look, and I'll be sure to talk over logistics and see what we can do for you. Speaking of patrons, let's go ahead and thank our lovely, wonderful patrons. Thanks to Janet for being our spooky skeleton tier contributor, and thanks to Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Martha, Marianne Schuler, Jennifer Damron, and Tyler Parker for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening and a spooky holiday season.